right here it's a okay marvelous thank you so much <laughs> <laughs> so um so this is, is really very much about the kind of part, the action part of um, this conference. And it's about how we take those range of background concerns and turn them into something um, something sort of practically and applied. And of course, one of the issues, um, certainly with regard to the academic community, one of the questions that came up um, to Lewis a little bit earlier is that there has always been this sort of tension about whether or not people who are engaged in the objective pursuit of scientific research and inquiry, at what point and, and how is your work affected should you become involved in any kind of kind of activism um does it compromise your objectivity does it raise questions um sort of reputational questions uh, and issues for you um but what i wanted to kind of um start with if we could go to the next slide is ma making a little point that this is not a new concern it's not a new concern in the sense that um the ethics in relation to um, science, and I have to be careful how I say that because I did actually grow up in Essex, but um, even in Essex, we talk about ethics and we just are very careful about how we pronounce it. Um, that uh, it, it's nothing new. And in fact, if we go back to this little kind of scrap of parchment here, which is the first, um, the earliest piece of evidence of the Hippocratic Oath, this actual bit, little bit of parchment dates from the third century AD, but the earliest known reference um, is fifth century BC. Um, it's a small point, um, but an interesting one that apparently there's general consensus that it wasn't actually Hippocrates who wrote the Hippocratic Oath, but he's been sort of settled with the, the idea of it ever since. So this idea that people who are engaged in the pursuit of science should not take a sort of a value ethical based stand on the work that they're doing is not a new thing. So if we could go to the next slide. Um, uh, we have proposed the idea of um, a science oath for climate, and, but you might ask why do we need it? Well, we think there's a number of reasons. We think that for a period of time there's been a concern amongst people working in the sector that there has been a degree of self-censorship in the scientific community, in the climate science community, where people haven't always felt able to speak publicly um, about their understanding of the logical implications of their work. This has been a combination of fears about reaction, reputation, and, 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 and career issues as well. Um, it's been the stuff of legend for anybody who has ever attended the climate conferences, that things which are said in public, in sort of private, are not repeated in, in public. And some of the concerns that have been aired in private have been, um, shall we say, more significant than what finds its way through into some of the published, um, some, of the, some, some of the publications. Um, and these are things to do with some of the issues that we were introduced to with Lewis's um, presentation on what are the practical lifestyle and economic implications of action to become um, compatible, to be aligned with 1.5. And if we can go to the next slide. Um, this, uh, we go back one, there we go. And, and so this kind of overlaps into, you know, once you start looking at these things in practice, the practicality proposed technical solutions as well, that there are major ethical issues around what pathway we take. The fact that a lot of the models in the climate science community contain um, what have been described as kind of quite unrealistic expectations about what technological fixes to do with carbon capture and storage can deliver. Um, but there are also many of the actual bodies, the sort of representative bodies, the professional organizations for the science and technology community have themselves not been aligning either in their practical way that they organize their own affairs or indeed in the kind of their public messaging about the issue with 1.5 pathways. And as a consequence of this, the public often hears quite mixed um, messages. And um, so in the oath, Boiling it down, what is it that we ask people to do? Um, people who are working in the sector, we ask them to commit to explaining the scientific evidence as they understand it, to speak out about the targets that have been internationally agreed of 1.5 and, and 2 degrees, to make commitments to do whatever they can as far as possible to align their personal behavior with those targets. Now, for some of the reasons about the lock-in of infrastructure that Lewis spoke about, those things are difficult to do, but this is a commitment to do what you can. And then very importantly, this question of crossing the line into a more um, 
public kind of activism where we seek to hold our organizations to account. Now, obviously, we would like um, people to sign up. Um, you can find it very easily on our website. It's on the front page. And coming soon, there's also going to be a sort of advisory guideline based, evidence based menu of actions that will be inviting people to take um, part with. Now, if we can go to the next one, and this is just to kind of give a little bit more detail about the pledges themselves. And that what we ask in the oath is that people explain honestly, clearly, and without compromise what the scientific evidence tells us about the seriousness of the climate emergency, not to um, second guess what might be deemed politically acceptable or in the language, you know, pragmatic or realistic from a political point of view, but to say what the, the science says is realistic about what needs to happen to tackle the problem. Um, and that to the best of our abilities and mindful of the urgent need for uh, change that we align our own behavior. And then uh, in sort of polite but firm ways, hold our own institutions to account. Now, so far, if we can go to the next um, slide, we have uh, 262 signatories of the oath, uh, with a large number being from the UK. The SGR is predominantly a UK-based organization, although we're now reaching out internationally, especially to the United States. Um, so we've got 142 um, international signatories too. Um, and I think we've got one more slide. This is just to give a little example of a flavor of what it actually means in practice to actually speak out in this way. Um, one of our patrons, um, Professor Bill Maguire, who's a volcanologist and a climate scientist by training, um, actually left, he chose to leave his um, organization because of its behavior and its relationships with fossil fuel companies. And of course, in the news very recently, another signatory of our oath, um, uh, Chris Rapley, Dr. Chris Rapley, um, decided to leave the board of the Science Museum over its refusal to drop fossil fuel sponsorship and how compromising that was, especially when they have um, exhibitions about, about climate change and about the climate science. So there's some examples of people actually kind of acting, putting, putting, putting things into practice. Um, I, do I have one last slide? I can't remember now. It's so long ago since I put the slides together. Um, so yes, what can you do? This is the most important part, of course. Well, if you haven't already, we would really like you to sign the oath and to take the actions and follow through on the commitments that there are at spelt out there. We'd love you to share the oath if you're on any social media platforms or merely in conversation there's a hashtag there's always a hashtag which is hashtag science oath um, and that was a new little exercise so that we can use the sort of social contagion effect what we know is that when other people see other people taking actions they're more likely to do so themselves so for those who um, feel able to do so we'd love you to video yourself saying that you'd signed the oath and maybe one line on why you signed the oath and you can send that to us in the usual ways on, on our email addresses that's info at sgr.org.uk or um, our lead campaigner on this is Calica who we'll be hearing from shortly um, at the the um, sgr.org.uk uh, um, address as well. So um, that's my potted summary of um, our Science Oath for Climate and how we hope it can build a community of people who are not only making changes themselves, but bringing those two things together of personal behavior change and system change by becoming agents and using what influence they can to change our institutions as well. So I will um, pause there and let's see if we have any um, questions of clarification or further elaboration.